we're going to see positive results on a physical level. On a biological level, we think that our 25 research subjects who are doing this diet with me are going to see positive results. We're going to get healthier. And also doing us uh, some exercises. The disenfranchisement of our people from our food sources, our traditional food sources. The reason why it's called the decolonizing diet project and not the decolonized, that you cannot simply cut yourself off from things that have been colonized. You can try your hardest, which is what we're doing, to get back to a place in your diet that's much closer to what our ancestors ate. Even if you go out and shoot a deer today, those deer are eating plants that have radioactivity in them. From Chernobyl, the other side of the world. But we have to be careful how much, how much fish we eat, mm -hmm. which is a really healthy thing. But at the same time, it's full of PCBs and mercury contamination. And so you got to care, be careful how much you eat nowadays. Our ancestors didn't have to really worry about PCBs. <laughs> Our next speaker, we're going to move on real quickly here to Martin Reinhardt from the Center for Native American Studies. We started uh, over a year and a half ago now, the planning for it, and we just recently started the implementation phase. And so I'll get into that as we go along here. If you have any questions as we go along, just let me know. It's kind of cool, this, this photo comes from the uh, Minnesota Historical Society. You can see a little Benoji here. This guy over here is dancing on the rice, little kids back here. And this lady here is parching wild rice. And you can just imagine that that's probably the lake where they got the rice up beyond there. It's kind of cool. We're going to be looking at it from a multi-dimensional perspective. We're going to be looking at the biological considerations. This circle here, we've talked a lot about the biology of stuff today, the physical plants, the things that they can do to your bodies. Uh, we're going to be talking about cultural. You know, we started off this morning with Earl talking about the cultural relationship that we have with these plants, especially these medicine plants. Uh, we also heard a little bit this morning about the legal political relationships we have. In fact, you know, when Jan's talking about the U.S. Forestry Service or the USDA and their kind of maps and borders, and we're also in that map, we know our tribes are there. These are our lands, Anishinaabe king. It's our land, and so we share these borders. In fact, I, I have my students, one of the things we start off the semesters with every time we talk about the uh, Thomas Theorem. Those things which people believe to be real are in fact real in their consequences. And if people believe this to be the United States and Michigan and Marquette or Hiawatha National Forest and not Anishinaabe of King, Mishike Minas, our traditional names and our traditional thoughts about these same places, it has consequences. These are some of the consequences we're dealing with. The disenfranchisement of our people from our food sources, our traditional food sources. So, we have a few goals for the Decolonizing Diet <coughs> Project. We want to connect or reconnect humans with foods that are indigenous to the Great Lakes region and foods that were part of the indigenous peoples, with a capital I, diets in the region prior to colonization. So in the DDP, we're talking about foods that are native, the native plant species that Jan was talking about, but also those cultivated species that we, as indigenous people, introduced into this region before others came along into the same area. So we were already cultivating species. You've heard of the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, that's it's kind of funny because my wife and our uh, friend April Lindela and one another friend, Lisa Bronx, and we may know Lisa, they were all kind of walking together. I said, hey, you guys look like corn, beans, and squash. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a fourth sister, though, some of you guys don't realize. A fourth sister that's common to native gardens. And I really didn't realize it until I started looking further into our food sources. And that's sunflowers. Often the corn, beans, and squash are grown together because they are uh, mutually beneficial to each other. But the sunflowers were planted along the sides of the kitagana, uh -huh. the garden. And that provided seeds, and also it would stop some animals from coming into the garden. They'd stop at the sunflowers. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so the other goal is to provide food-related data 
uh, for tribal communities and others that are working toward revitalization of our indigenous communities and cultures. We want to provide real data. Because oftentimes when we're talking about uh, these connections between spirituality and food, or spirituality and plants or animals, uh, they, we often talk about it anecdotally. We don't have real good sources of data, no research subjects, no uh, long-term study of these things from a scientific perspective. And so they always kind of look down their noses at us from a scientific perspective, right? And I think it's important as we talk about these things that we reflect on the spiritual kinship that we have with these plants and animals. As I've been doing this project over the last year and a half, and now have been eating this diet for the past two and a half weeks, I'm doing pretty good, by the way. I only, only messed up one time. And I'll tell you about that later. But doing pretty well. But I, was, I woke up the other morning, and I had this song in my head. You ever hear the, uh, the African slave call and response songs, you know? Uh, well, I woke up, and I had this song in my head, and it said, Does somebody... And then I heard off in the distance, Does somebody... Remember me, remember me, who remembers me? And I was thinking, man, that's those plants and animals, you know, that are like way back there, the ones that we've forgotten as a people, you know, that we don't recognize, you know, we can't. If we go out in the woods right now, how many of us even recognize these plants? How many remember the smells? How many remember that connection that we've had? Thousands of years of connection to these <laughs> brothers and sister beings in this area, and we don't remember them. So it's kind of cool when those things come to you in your, in your sleep. So with that kind of uh, theoretical or philosophical approach, we came up with a couple hypotheses that we're going to prove or disprove during this course of the study, hopefully. And of course the first one would be that we're going to see positive results on a physical level. On a biological level, we think that our 25 research subjects who are doing this diet with me are going to see positive results. We're going to get healthier by eating this way. And also doing us uh, some exercises. Because health and exercise, or eating and exercise kind of go hand in hand. We also have another hypothesis though. And that is that the people who are doing this are going to run into some serious roadblocks be that cultural or legal political. And so as a part of this, we're finding that we may not necessarily be able to go eat at a restaurant. You can't necessarily go to a supermarket and say, hey, I'd like all that indigenous food. <laughs> <laughs> This helps it to keep it from getting root bound so that it will spread out. Do you smell that medicine? You guys smell that? That's good.